All right. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. We can get the attention of the room. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a loudspeaker or anything, so can folks in the back hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Welcome, everyone, to DEF CON 864's uh, monthly meeting. Uh, I know we're presenting here from Anderson University. We normally present our host uh, in Greenville, normally at one of the libraries, either on Pelham Road or downtown in Greenville. And it's always the first uh, Thursday of each month when we have our meetings. We're just going to go through some uh, standard items that we have with all of our meetings. Uh, as part of DEF CON 864, these are our codes of conduct. Uh, there is no formal membership. It's really it's just a, a group of folks that share an interest in cybersecurity, whether that's on the, the blue team or defense or red team and offense. Sometimes we like to mix the two together and make purple. Uh, but the core tenant is don't be rude. Uh, respect the privacy of others. We don't condone illegal activities, so folks have gone to us trying to look for that. We don't condone it, nor do we participate in it. Academic and professional dishonesty is prohibited, and law enforcement is encouraged. Let's just be honest. Uh, and at the end of the day, persons who are disruptive or hazardous will not be welcome at DEF CON 864. So if you want continuing education credits, I imagine some of you are in school for some reason. Uh, when attending our meetings, you can earn, uh, like for those in the industry that have certifications, you can get CPEs or continuing education units. So for your classes, I'm sure you could also likely get credit. I think at the end of this presentation, we'll have something at the end that helps you get credit uh, for attending. But I believe that's with any of our, our meetings, there are potential for you to leverage it for continuing education units. It's also worth noting that we do welcome our members to host and give presentations as well. And that can also net you some additional hours depending on the program you're working with. So we do run a website, it's dc864.org. And we happen to have our full meeting schedule and agenda. It's pretty much booked out for all of 2023. Um, we're probably looking into anyone who wants to speak in 2024. So always welcome to reach out to the leads. Uh, we got, we'll do intros at the end of the presentation, but just to kind of call out leads, we've got Luke here in the front row. We got JT. We have myself, Eric, and then we got Ben in the back right over here. So if you, you know, reach a point you want to show interest in speaking, we're the board to kind of reach out to. And so for the announcements, uh, we always like to cover cybersecurity conferences in the area. So what's that? Uh, I think it's number four. Number four? <laughs> there we go. Well, then with that, we're going to open this up to Chris, where he's going to be going over hacking your career with AI. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Well, I'm excited to be here. I like talking to people, as my wife will surely tell you, I like to run my jaws. Um, I'm really fortunate to be able to talk with you guys today. It's really fun. Um, it's fun to see all the young people here. You guys are our future, and I'm really passionate about that. So I think it's great that you're here. Um, this is kind of a catchy title. Everyone knows about Chat GPT, right? Everyone, oh, AI is the thing, and that's the new hotness. And if you're not talking about Chat GPT, then you're not talking about anything. Maybe, I don't know, but we'll talk about some of those things here in a moment. So uh, we'll dive right in if I can figure out how to work the Windows PC. All right. Um, hacking your career using AI. So some of you don't have a career yet, but you're going to be looking for a job. We'll talk about how you can leverage chat GPT for that, how you could upscale yourself, how you can figure out how to get a new job. Maybe you're in a job that you don't like or you want to uh, go somewhere different. I'll tell you some of the things that you can use ChatGPT for. Basically, this talk is around helping you understand ChatGPT is not uh, 
the demon that we've been told it's been, if you look at any of the uh, articles or anything else, the chat GPT is taking over the world, it's taking over our jobs, it's creating morphing malware, all those things are potentially true, but there are things that we could talk about that um, are good about it. So we'll dive right in. Uh, some things that I do. So I've been in the industry uh, for about 12 years. Uh, I work for Fortalist Solutions based out of Washington, D.C., uh, I work for the first female CIO of the White House. We're an entirely female-ran company from a leadership perspective. Uh, we are really passionate about that. Um, we need more cybersecurity people that don't look like me. Maybe not necessarily as ugly as I am, but we need more females. We need more people of color. We need a lot more coming into our uh, profession. So I think it's important. Uh, you'll see some of the uh, initials down there. Uh, tons of certifications. What does that mean? It means I have a lot of CPEs, and you guys are helping me get my CPE, so thank you for that. Uh, I do some work for SANS as well. You guys know SANS is a training organization. Uh, I'm a security leadership um, <coughs> SME, they call it, subject matter expert, so I write some of their uh, program. I write some of their uh, certifications and do some QA there. And I also worked for McGraw-Hill. Uh, last book I worked on was a G-Pen book, so I was a technical editor for them as well. So what does all this mean? It means I do a lot of stuff and I get to see a lot of stuff, which is really fun and really uh, important for me. I think it's really important for those who want a career that doesn't uh, you know, put you in a silo, so to speak. A lot of cybersecurity careers are like that, right? If you go work at a bank, for example, and you're the firewall person or you're the EDR person, that's what you're going to be to the day that you die. How do you move up in a bank? You move out of the bank and then move back in which no bueno for me. So uh, I work for a consultancy. I always work for a consultancy because I get bored looking at the same things over and over again. Uh, this talk should be interactive. If you have a question, yell it out, throw something at me. I'm glad to have a conversation. But if you guys are just sitting there like this is a lecture, this is not going to be very much fun for you. You're going to get tired of hearing my uh, voice. So any questions about experience here? Somebody. Yes, sir. When did that G-Pen book come out? Uh, G-Pen released 18 months ago, okay. so yeah, it's on Amazon now. I think it's only like $25, so it's uh, compared to go to the G-Pen course, which is $7,000. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good value. Uh, am I saying you could pass a G-Pen by reading that book? No, but if you do the labs, you certainly have a good chance of doing it. I consider G-Pen to be one step under OSCP. All of you are probably aware of OSCP and kind of the grueling portion of that. Uh, G-Pen would be the step down from that. Um, I'm not a penetration tester. I don't necessarily care about breaking things, but I care about what it looks like while I'm defending it. That's why I took the course. That's why I worked on this book. If I don't understand the methodology of the attackers or the adversaries coming at me, it's very hard for me to, to uh, defense against, defend against it. So, again, you see my title there. Uh, I came to security. I didn't know security from a toaster. Like literally, didn't didn't have a concept of all. I just had a lot of passion. So. The last company I joined, I was employee number 11, and when I left there, we had 450 employees, and that was a little much for me, but I started out as a, just a contract engineer, worked my way up through security engineer, and by the time I left, I was a director of all of our security engineers, so that's not anything necessarily about me. It's more about uh, the opportunities I've been given. I've been incredibly blessed. I grew up in a rural town here in South Carolina. There was no reason to believe that I would amount to anything. I've been all over the world doing security, literally, so... Um, if you think you, uh, your uh, upbringing dictates where you're going, it does not, I can assure you. Um, anyway, any other questions around some of these certifications and all these initials? I could talk all day about them because they're very expensive. They didn't cost me anything. My employer was uh, happy to pay for them, so I'm thankful. I wouldn't pay that for them. Uh, again, I work for Fordless. I won't go too deep into that. If you want to talk about Fordless later, I'm not here to sell you anything, but this is a company, again, we're a woman-owned small business. Uh, most all of our employees have top secret clearance, so we work both in government and commercial um, clients. Again, glad to have that conversation with you later, but that's not what we're here for today. We're here to talk about OpenAI. Do you guys play around with OpenAI now, ChatGPT specifically? Yeah, yeah. Is it powerful to you? Is anyone paying for the premium version yet? 
I'm not either. I've been thinking about it. Right? It's like 20 bucks, but I mean, it's become part of my workflow, really. And I'll show you some of the things that, that I do with it uh, specifically. I think it's the future, and we'll talk about why it's important that it's the future, but I always like to do a quick agenda just to let you know kind of where we're going, and, and, and so you'll know <laughs> when I'll be done. Um, anyway, first off, we want to embrace the disruption. We'll talk about that in just a second and then what that means. We'll talk about finding a position, writing a report, and conveying risk. We'll also talk about the privacy concerns, and of chat GPT, there are many. Uh, so these are things to think about. And there's a bonus slide at the end for accelerating your career. So that's to get you guys to hang out and stay till the end of me uh, running my jaw. So we'll keep moving. Uh, first off, the disruption. So if you read any articles, look at any you know, bleeping computer, any of the new uh, news feeds that come out, it's about how attackers are using chat GPT. They're writing uh, you know, polymorphic malware. We're seeing them... Uh, Write, use ChatGPT and other AI to write better phishing emails. So it used to be you would see broken English, right? Uh, obviously, it looks like Eastern European type of language. Uh, sometimes it looks other things. You could tell that it just didn't sound really good. The phishing emails are getting much more polished now. What does that mean? It's a lot more likely for your users to click on them. I think that's problematic, right? It's good that this tool exists, but as we lower the bar of entry, for cyber criminals, what does that mean for us, right? There's more things for us to defend against and more things for us to understand. That's one of the challenges I think we have to, to figure out how we do that. Um, the one on the right there, uh, will AI replace cybersecurity jobs? Does anyone have a thought on that? Yeah. Not in my lifetime. Not in your lifetime? Okay. Anybody else have a different thought? I think it will replace certain aspects of work. Uh -huh. Just like um, machines have replaced humans in factories and mm. manufacturing and, and other aspects, there's there's drudgery that humans are not um, not that great at, at scaling up to, mm. such as watching 100 CCTV feeds or or um, just automated stuff. Sure. Um, watching a sim constantly scroll past and, and looking for the important things. Uh, those are certain parts, I think, that will be replaced. But they're not going to replace the creativity and the knowledge and and all of the collective experience and the collaboration of humans, not for the near future. That disclaimer at the end means that you think it will happen at some point? Slowly. Just like uh, the Industrial Revolution changed so many things. We thought everybody would be out of a job, hmm. but we're not. And you think not in your lifetime? Yeah. Yeah, that's not coming for you? I agree that the, the automation is there, but I'm trying to automate everything Anyways, that is. Automate all the things, right? Yeah. The tedious tasks, for sure. I would say automation would go both ways. So I, I think you would still need cybersecurity professionals because if you want to, quote, like fight fire with fire, you can fight AI's automation with more AI automation, but you're still going to need cybersecurity professionals to understand why criminals are using ChatGPT and how they're using it. If you're just using AI, competing against AI, it's like battle box. There's still people building those machines. So I think you'd still need those professionals to have an understanding of why people are doing it and how to prevent it. There's so, there's so much that AI can do, but it, it's not, it, um, the humanity, it doesn't have humanity. And so there's still an aspect that goes into that, that goes behind certain, it can go behind anything. And so my, my initial thought and pretty much what I'll think about, I mean, kind of open AI replacing cybersecurity. Open AI can be implemented into cybersecurity defense, but it's not gonna replace it because open AI, open AI can take on things that open AI can do, not what humans can do. Because, or like, emotionally, I guess. Um, because they can't speak and I can't word what- No, you're cool, keep going. But <laughs> you, you, you kinda get what- Yeah, no, I, get, I yeah. get where you're coming from, and I don't disagree. Well, I think it's problematic, uh, kind of what, Luke spoke to earlier, it's some of those jobs are going away. I'm okay with that, right? I'm not good at doing tedious things. I, I think that they're a, a bit of a challenge. I don't think humans are very good at spotting patterns. Uh, so think about, uh, let's talk about a random port scan, for example. A random port scan kicks off on a Monday and it scans uh, port 20 of XIP, right? And then it waits till Wednesday to scan port 21. Then it waits till Friday to scan port 22, then it waits till the next Wednesday to scan port 23. How do you keep that thread going? It's incredibly difficult to do that with tooling now. 
it's really easy to do that with AI, right? It's really easy to be able to, to keep those things uh, moving in the same track. So um, these naysayers that are saying all of our jobs are going away, I, I don't think that's an issue at all. I think some of the jobs are absolutely going away. So it is what it is, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more how you guard against that. But I absolutely believe that a lot of these things are going to take over the tedious tasks that really nobody wanted to do anyway. Right? you got to cut your teeth to get into cybersecurity. you got to do these things. These are all the barriers that we're trying to lower to get more people into the profession. So I think it absolutely is a, a thing to think about. I don't know that it's going to be uh, as detrimental as we say. But we'll talk a little more about that also. Um, who knows this guy? Satya Nadella. All hands going up, I hope. Yeah, those people. Yeah, so uh, Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO. He was started with Microsoft in 1992. Uh, he became the CEO in 2014. It is my assertion that Satya Nadella transformed Microsoft in a way that Bill Gates never could. Uh, obviously, more than Steve Ballmer could ever do. Uh, if you think about all the things uh, that has happened under Satya Nadella's leadership, think about the, the cloud transformation. When he first came in, AWS was the only cloud that existed, right? So that's what everyone was using. I didn't think uh, AWS could be dethroned when he first started. You know, we're going to do this Azure thing, and maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. I don't go into a client shop now who doesn't have some type of Azure AD, right, whether it's Active Directory and Azure or something else. So the cloud transformation that he's led has been uh, incredibly significant. The next thing you see there, he's led the acquisition of, of Minecraft, LinkedIn, and GitHub. Think about that. GitHub, but... They announced Microsoft was buying GitHub. Is there anybody that thought that GitHub was going down at that point where we're going to have a problem? Some of you may not be old enough to know. Mm -hmm. He was <laughs> It wasn't that long ago. I'm old. But anyway, yeah, so I thought as soon as Microsoft buys GitHub, it's going down the toilet. We're going to have problems. It's not going to work the way that it did. Now GitHub is the leader um, in any type of code review. Uh, the lead, uh, he led the transformation in cybersecurity. If you would have told me six years ago that I would tell clients that they should look at a Microsoft cybersecurity tool, I would tell you you were nuts. There's no way that's ever going to happen. Microsoft is awful for security. You can pop a shell in 13.2 seconds. Why would we ever consider doing security with them? Now I talk about them at least weekly. If they're the right fit for a client, look at Defender ATP and MCAS. And if you don't like the name of their tool, just give another week and they'll change the name again. But there's tons of different tools that Microsoft is putting in. And that's what happens when you have more money than anybody, right? You can put as much money into it that you want. So uh, the transition into being a cybersecurity company is, is huge, in my opinion. And the last thing that you see there, I don't know if you guys have heard, but the billions of dollars that Microsoft has spent on ChatGPT. If you look at his resume of the things that he's done, it's hard not to think that ChatGPT and OpenAI in general is kind of the, the future, right? Consider adding Bing with uh, OpenAI on the back end. It's really compelling. And the reason I talk about all these things, this is not, I'm not a Satya Nadella fanboy. I don't use Microsoft products all that much except Office because everyone has to use Office. But uh, yeah, the reason I'm telling you about this is because he has embraced and almost caused a disruption. So he saw that selling licenses to Office for the next 15 years is not going to grow Microsoft into what it is today. He saw that those things weren't um, going to be uh, strategic for them long term, so he led some of these um, programs. Anyone heard of John Hunt? John Hunt in the uh, 1890s uh, was in London, England, and at the time uh, he was working trying to be an entrepreneur himself. Maybe uh, many Satya Nadella, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the problem at that point in London and a lot of other cities that were beginning to get large is that there was a transportation issue. Uh, horse and buggies, right? We're carting people around on horse and buggies. is problematic. The prognosticators of that time indicated that the only way the cities can grow is if we do something about the horses and buggies. But what's the problem with horses and buggies? Manure, right? Manure and urine. That's a problem. So uh, John Hunt is working on how do I fix this problem? That was his primary job. He would go through and uh, they call him uh, the nightman, what the nightman went through. And uh, nightman comes through and cleans all of the um, unwanted things out of the street. So the next day you can go through freely. So he was working on this invention. Uh, to catch some of those things on the horse, instead of it going into the street, it would be much easier to clean up. 
What happened not long after this? Before my time, I'm not that old, if you guys are wondering. Yeah, so uh, automobiles happened. Uh, automobiles became a thing, right? So, and John Hunt's like, well, it's a fluke, right? It's not going to happen. What are we going to have a gas station in every city? Now there's a gas station on every block, right? So he didn't embrace the disruption. And I don't want that to ever be something that you think about, right? Now is the time to get on board with uh, AI and, and chat GPT. However you use it, we'll talk about some of those things, but don't sit back and think that, you know, this thing is not going to impact me or it's not going to happen in my lifetime or it's not going to happen in, in my job search. You should be getting on that bandwagon now. So any questions about this? You guys are making it easy on me. Nick's here now. He's going to give me some headaches, so I like that. So find a new position. How many in here have a resume? Nice. How many in here have multiple resumes? Nice. I like that. Why do you have multiple resumes? Different jobs. More different careers. Different. Okay. Specially tailored for different positions. Why is that important? Different employees are looking for different things. You want to get past the yeah. AI. Yeah. <laughs> Gold star for that dude. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I agree with you there. You should have multiple resumes because that's really important. Uh, you guys are, are hitting all over it. Uh, you should have a resume that reflects whatever the job description that you're going after is. So all the b bottom work experience and education, all that can be the same, but the very top objective should be tailored for whatever job you're going after. It should absolutely highlight whatever it is that you're wanting to do. So what I did here is just found a random posting on Indeed for a junior pen tester in Charleston. I copy and pasted the required section out of it and put into chat GPT. Write a resume objective for a junior pen tester, for black liner, and blah, blah, blah. You see all the stuff, the copy and paste here. This is really easy to do at this point, right? So I could have a gazillion resumes. I don't have to rewrite them every time. It's really easy to go and paste in what I want. Another thing that's important, we talked about getting past the AI. It also gets past um, something that's not nearly as smart as AI, HR people. Uh, they're looking for uh, particular words, right? They're looking for particular keywords, uh, things like that. So those are things that you want to get past. Um, if you don't have CISSP, for example, listed somewhere, oh, well, you can't be part of this group or what have you. So being able to put those keywords in means if they're using OCR or something else or they're using a, an HR screener to go through these things, it makes it really easy. So let's see what I think is next. This is the... Um, objective that it wrote for this particular position. I'll give you guys just a second to look at it. Can we work with that? Is it perfect? No. Nope. Never will be, right? It always takes a human touch to go in after it. But if I'm looking at a blank resume objective, and I can copy and paste some stuff into OpenAI, and it gives me this. It gives me something to work from. I think that's what's important. It's not going to replace you doing your job. It's not going to replace you going out and finding jobs. But if it gives you something to start from, technical people in general, myself included, uh, we don't really like writing reports, right? We don't really like doing the writing portion of it. We want to go break some stuff. We want to go hack some stuff. We want to do investigations. I get it. This is a very easy way to get some good information back from that way. Anyone disagree or have questions about this one? How did you like? How did you know? Are there like tips and tricks on what to search for, like for keywords and things to get the best possible response from it? When you are talking about in Chat GPT uh, or no? Yeah. yeah. So the more descriptive you can be, the better. So uh, you know, if you, if I put write a you know, resume objective for a junior pen tester, it would have came back with some generic nonsense. But you see, I added some extra things, right? Uh, using the uh, uh, the experience I have, 12 years, Fortune 500 companies familiar with compliance regulations, and I actually pasted in the job description. So I took their own job description and posted it in ChatGPT, and it came out with this. So all of their keywords that they're asked for, more than likely are going to be here, or enough of them, so I can get past the screening uh, process. And that's what finding a job is, by the way, just getting to the next call, right? Getting to the next interview, getting past those first person. It's a good question. Yes? Uh, oh, you go you. Oh, does uh, ChatGPT accept like specific search keys or strings, kind of like how it searches in the legal world, where you can like dorks. do like site for? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that it'll do like Google Dorks. I haven't tried that, but I will make a note and try that tonight. I think. Um, so the difference between 
chat GPT in a regular search engine, right? It's going to be more conversational. So you could probably do that, but I haven't tried it, so I really don't know. It's a good question. So imagine uh, I'm an employer, right? Uh -huh. And I get 20 resumes. Uh -huh. Am I going to start seeing 10 out of 20 resumes all looking very similar? Is everybody using chat GPT to write their own resume? Potentially. Um, we can, how can we, how, like, as a student, or anybody looking for a job, how can we avoid our chat GPT res uh, responses looking like the guy next door? So we are in a higher education institute. I will be careful how I mention this, but there are ways with chat GPT that you can translate this document, right? So I did it in English. Maybe I want to translate it to French and then translate it to German and then translate that back to English. That's obfuscation at that point, right? So that way my resume is going to look completely different than others. Also, if I'm writing a paper and I want to submit something, I might do that, get past some of those checks. Allegedly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's probably not ideal to have at a university talk, I guess, but I'm a bit of an idiot. But anyway, uh, we'll keep moving. So uh, writing reports, we talked about that. Technical people don't like writing reports. I don't like writing reports. I've been doing this 12 years. And first off, I've read a lot of reports. I've read a lot of penetration testing reports. And gosh, most of them are awful, right? They have great screenshots, and they can show me exactly how that popped that shell. They can show me all the things, how they moved laterally. They don't tell me why I care. They don't tell me what the issue is, right? Tell me like, tell me what the vulnerability is and how I can fix it. So I function as a virtual CISO for three companies. I lead our vCISO practice. We've got vCISOs that we do that. Again, I'm reading uh, reports, not necessarily. I don't typically do vCISO when we do the penetration test for the client just because that's a, a mixing of two things I don't really like to do. Anyway, so I read a lot of reports, right? They come from us from all over, um, all over the place. I would say 70%. I wouldn't call them garbage, but I wouldn't want to submit them. I've got a friend, Brandon Martin, and I know that Nick knows him. He always preaches that uh, the very last thing that you leave with a client is a deliverable, the report. And it's going to be read a heck of a lot more times than it's written. You know, they've spent 30, 40K, 50K, sometimes more, uh, and all they have at the end of it is this report that you gave them. If you didn't make it good, then what did you do, right? If you didn't convey the risk, if you didn't tell them what they needed to do, what is the point? So I'll get off my soapbox about that. I think it's really important that we write good reports. You'll see what we put here. I said write a penetration test report conducted by Acme Security Company uh, for XYZ Logistics, explaining that there's multiple eternal blue vulnerabilities, which is like 10 years old or something now. You still see in the wild, by the way, uh, on, on critical servers, including domain controllers. So I popped that into chat GPT. This is part of, of what came back. So um, is it perfect? Nope. Does it get me closer to where I need to be? Absolutely. Am I super duper lazy? You know I am. <laughs> yeah, so I can take this and, and tweak it a little bit to get relatively good information out of it. Again, that, you know, this is all test information and things like that, but it's really easy to be able to take this and use it. Uh, for your own uses. Like, there's so many things you could do with it, uh, but we'll talk about some of the privacy to keep that in mind. So, any questions about this part? This, I think, is a great example of the limitations of ChatGPT and something you just said about writing good reports. Mm -hmm. This is describing what the vulnerability is and what the impact and outcome is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mention a single word about the systemic issues and breakdowns in that organization who has multiple similar vulnerabilities from 10 years ago. That mm -hmm. tells a bigger story than the fact that the vulnerabilities exist. The fact that you haven't passed your stuff in a decade tells a lot more. <laughs> Do you think if I put that into the chat GPT and, and wanted to explain how that's bad and this is 10 years old, it could come back with that? I bet it could. So that means the user needs to be smart in asking the right questions. 100%, trillion percent, gold star. Absolutely. If you're not putting in good information, you're going to get jumped back every time. And I've tried that, right? Just put in some nonsense and it gives me nonsense back. I found that the more uh, narrowed I gave it, the more uh, search information I gave it, the better the uh, output is. But it was never perfect. You know, I could never copy and paste that into a report. It just, just wasn't readable, right? It just wasn't up to the level that I would want it to be. But I can take this relatively easy, clean it up, and send it on its way. So. This is definitely a help, right? Because it gets it gets you out of the you tell the narrative, but you're not writing all the individual boilerplate stuff. Because you'll you'll write that exact same description for every eternal blue that you come across. Basically. Minor modification, maybe. 
Yeah, you write it though. I just copy and paste. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's in a document somewhere yeah. where you go copy and paste into your right. report or something else, and it's the same thing that you said fourteen different customers for the past fourteen different weeks. This is at least a little bit different. At the end of the day, it's still you're still the one who has to prove that you're going to make this good. Make this good. Absolutely, it's it, there's no automated pen test and there's no automated pen test reporting, right? So, so we might kick off a Vuln scan and say, "Here's your pen test." Absolutely not, unless it's validated. I want to hear it. Like, Get out of here. Yeah, so, but this is absolutely, you've got to validate it the same way that you would validate a vulnerability scan. This is a really the other type. Do you think this kind of process could cause an issue, though, where people are too simply becoming more and more compliant because they are trying to use a tool like ChatGPT too frequently to do job like this? Is it bad to be too compliant? It can be. Tell me why. If you're too compliant, maybe if you're just, oh, I'm just going to keep using this the same topic. Oh, can I actually? Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I had a client recently, and we were talking about this. I told him I was working on a talk, and he's like, well, you know, you can do a you know, penetration test, uh, you know, with OpenAI now. And I was like, well, yeah, you could. Uh, that's really a vulnerability scan, and you certainly could do that. Why don't you do that before we show up? Right, get the most value out of it, and then let us come in and hammer on it and find the actual vulnerabilities. I don't want to find a low hanging fruit. You're wasting my time. You paid me 20k to come here and find some nonsense you could have patched before I showed up. It's ridiculous. I, I tell people all the time, like, don't waste your money. Like, but if you want to waste your money, we'll be glad to take it. Um, again, I, I agree with you 100. percent It could create complacency. You know, questions about this part? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna miss the agenda. Um, but are you going to go into some potential privacy concerns with using ChatGPT? Are there privacy concerns with ChatGPT? Depends on what absolutely. you give it. I'd be, um, I'd be pretty upset if I paid you some, you know, five figures and then you put my information on ChatGPT and now they know what I'm vulnerable for too before I can patch it myself. Mm. I think there is a, in the they in terms of use, you're not supposed to give it PII. Exactly. Like, and they say that they don't. Yeah. Who reads the terms of use? Yeah. 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 You're not supposed to. Yeah. 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 But it still advises you don't put it in there. So why why not tell us? To put it, why just not take it? You know, does it still tell you not to do it? Yeah. So I owe you guys uh, Coke. Uh, that's exactly what one of the slides was talking about. Is what do they do with your data? Uh, so you would never, ever want to put in the actual company name here. You want to obfuscate that. You never want to put in IP addresses, anything that you would not want to be able to control at that point. You absolutely do not want to put in the chat GPT. I wouldn't put real names in it. I wouldn't put addresses in it. I wouldn't put anything else. I would put placeholders for everything else. Because every piece of data that you put in there becomes their data. To your point, you paid me 20K to done do a pen test, and now all my vulnerabilities exist in chat GPT for someone to go look at? Big problem. Yeah, I don't like that idea at all. So, yeah, you're 100% right. I think there's danger there, and I don't think people, again, we don't read the terms of service. This is the big thing that popped up when I was looking for it. But if you dig into it, and I've read some of that, it's a little bit bleary-eyeing to look through. But basically what it says is if you put any data in here, we own it. So do with that what you wish, right? If you wouldn't put it on Facebook or Twitter, Gram, whatever it is, don't put it in chat GPT. Yeah. So, um one of the things that's a privacy concern just for the internet in general, you go to a website, even if you have do not track, you, you block origin, whatever, mm -hmm. it's still fingerprinting everything else. Mm -hmm. How do you know uh, or how do you protect against putting even obfuscated, I didn't put the IP address, I didn't put the company, mm -hmm. but the things you said is still fingerprinted in a way that ties it to XYG, XYZ logistics, and you didn't know that those were fingerprinting uh, things that you gave over. So, are you saying I'm not obfuscating the name, like X Y, because X Y G Z logistics is not real? No, no. no. Um, so, we we might have you block origin on. Mm -hmm. So we we block Facebook trackers. Right. But the site that we go to still gets our user agent history, sure, sure. our screen size, whatever. Uh, address. Address. Yes. Um, how Chat GPT potentially has access to all of that, and if you're saying. XYZ logistics company, and it is a logistics company. They know you're in the southeast, you're doing security things, and you have other context there, like a open, um, like Active Directory server on the the LAN. It's a 
potential easy showed in query to then say, oh, this is the exact company without without you typing in that detail. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. It's certainly a possibility. It's probably not my threat model. I think that's more than uh, targeted attack and things like that. But how do you get around that, right? So I, I would typically use a virtual machine to do that and destroy the virtual machine in between. I mean, I'm working on, when I'm working for a client, I typically do all my work out of virtual machine and I'll destroy the virtual machine and start over again. Just because of that fingerprinting issue, always use a VPN, right? Proton is the one that I like. Um, use whatever you want, but Proton seems to be the best one. But there are ways that you can get around it, but I agree with you that uh, fingerprinting of browsers is a potential issue. I just don't think I put anything in here that I cared that someone knew about, right? I might be doing a test for a logistics company, but I say it's a, a university, for example, or something else. So yeah, there's really no way to block it that I'm aware of anyway. Our business users, on the other hand, are going to drop Oh. At least company confidential type information in there to help their job get easier. A million percent. Yeah, think about Grammarly. You guys familiar with Grammarly? Oh, uh, you mean Keylogger? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it does. And we try to explain that to our clients. They're like, but it makes our job so easy. Our marketing people love it. Yes, but you're giving away the entire uh, your entire data set by doing that. So, yeah, I, I'm with you there. I'm huge into privacy and things like that. So we could talk about that all night. But, again, I don't know that that's our threat model at this point, as long as we're doing um, just the basic things to obfuscate the data. Uh, I'll go back just a second. Uh, one of the parts of the title of this is how to convey risk. So we, as technical people, don't speak business as a general rule. I talk to business leaders all the time. I talk to C-suite folks all the time, and it constantly is me trying to figure out what they're saying, right? Uh, just because I'm, I'm relatively technical, but I'm not in their business realm. Uh, what they ultimately care about is, is risk. If you can convey a risk to them, that's what's important. So uh, what I did here is write an executive summary for Eagle Hospital System to explain the risk of a hospital not having a formalized vulnerability management that the CEO and CFO could understand. Will the CEO understand? Probably not. But we at least put it in something that he will be able to get and understand that he has a risk. So, again, this is not perfect. It's not going to be something you're going to be able to copy and paste to be done with. But it's something to, to, to start with. So I think it's important. I think we have to get better as a security community conveying risk, right? These people are spending money. We are here to support the business. If we can't show a proper return on investment, then they should kick us out, right? Why should they care about security if we can't show that we're going to reduce our risk and ultimately help them do business? So any questions about conveying risk? And I'm getting close to my time. I want to be respectful of you guys. Who thinks this part sucks? Who thinks like, man, you couldn't actually do that in a business? Somebody, right? Let's debate Surely I'm not always right, right, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> My wife is sitting in the back here. So uh, I live like seven minutes from here, so it's really convenient for me to come. And I'm really thankful to be able to come uh, talk to you guys today. So uh, we have a question. Great. <clears throat> so it says, uh, curious about Chris's thoughts surrounding ownership IP of what ChatGPT spits out, asking it to write code, et cetera. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things to think about here. One is... Were you employed to write that code? And do you have the right to be able to form it out or have ChatGPT do it or get someone on Fiverr to do it or something else, right? So the ownership at that point, the code is written by the program, so they technically own it because they own everything that goes in and out of it. Could you resell that to someone? You absolutely could. Um, I would have my legal folks read over the contract, right? If you're contracting me to write this from scratch, which no one ever does, but I want to make sure that there's specific clauses in there to cover me uh, no matter what tool I use, right? It's just like using a library or something else, but this will actually do a lot of the work for you. Um, it's a bit challenging, though, right? Again, it's a bit nebulous because we're in the middle of this um, right now. So. Good question. Any other questions? Uh, another Hi. thing would be the thing with ChatGPT, and I know in this kind of situation, you're just using it as a jumping off to get down. <laughs> And so I just touch it up. But the thing ChatGPT doesn't know, but someone else, what is the audience? Mm -hmm. So it would depend on to who you're, you're presenting this report. And mm -hmm. I mean, ChatGPT gives very, like, I would say it usually gives very, like, elementary standards, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a very baseline kind of thing, which would be great if you're presenting to people who don't really work with cyber or upper management. But if you're getting into, like, the more technical parts of it, you're still going to end up doing a lot of work to, to kind of reformat that. 
and, and let people understand it. So I think the audience is a big part too. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And I would say the more detail oriented and technical that you get, the less useful this is. So it's a curve actually. Uh, for most of the folks who are in, you know, we said for CEO or CFO, uh, this is as much as they can handle, right? This is as much as they can digest. Uh, I would not want to present this to someone who's, um, you know, very well educated in some of these things. I um, think you, you skirt into the privacy area when you do that, right? Because if you, if you get too granular, right? Yeah. You don't want to say somebody's name. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, you, again, you, it's a balance. Again, this is, again, to your point, it's jumping off, right? Just give me something to start from. Because I don't know about you guys, but when I sit in front of a blank Word document knowing I have to have a 12-page report, man, it's really um, a headache for me. Um, anyway, but yeah, I think those are all good points. I think what we have touched on but not really got into is that we are at the precipice of a new age, right? If you think about the Industrial Revolution, if you think about the invention of automobiles, uh, there, were, there were naysayers there. There were folks who didn't get on board. There were folks who thought it was a passing fad. If you look at the information age, which is not that long ago, there were folks who didn't think it was going to happen. That's exactly where we are now. So it's better for you to get ahead of the curve. That's what I'm just trying to tell you, man. Make sure that you're thinking about those things long term. So, uh, And I promise you guys a bonus. Uh, if you're trying to accelerate your career, how do you get in front of more people? How do you get more uh, you know, networking opportunities and things like that? Uh, the bonus here is um, have ChatGPT write you um, a DEF CON talk. So much of the information that I um, came and talked with you about today uh, came straight from ChatGPT. So the article research that I did, the research that I did on the vulnerabilities, doing reports and things like that, I plugged that right into ChatGPT and it gave me a pretty good script to start from. So. These are ways that you could actually do that, right? Again, it's a life hack to be able to do it and accelerate yourself. Again, this is um, something to think about, but you absolutely could do that. And not that difficult, right? It doesn't have to be DEF CON. It could be a B-side song. It could be whatever. Again, use the tools that you have. So that's what I've got for you guys. Uh, I would love to connect with you all. Again, I know I'm out of time here. If you want to get with me on LinkedIn or go to our website or whatever, you're welcome to. I would love to have connections. Uh, please reach out to me. Yes, sir. Um, where are we, like, can we get these slides off the, off the Discord or where can we find you? Yeah, so I'll be providing yeah. slides and you can download them and do them wherever you want. Yeah, so I'll post them to the DEF CON or DC864.org website, and then we'll also be cutting this to YouTube in the next month. It's about how long it takes me to edit it. Thank you. Will I be a YouTube star then? Is that? Yeah. Okay, okay good. Kick off Chris. <laughs> Yeah, other questions that you guys have? I know, again, we're running out of time. Is there any other questions that you have? You just got a small town in South Carolina. Uh-huh. Thanks for asking. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, I'm also, I'm from Pickens. Well, Cleveland. Oh. So. No, I know. I, the lower part of the state, right outside of Charleston. Right? So, yeah, not, not that area. But I've been here like 20-some-odd years, so I'm basically a local now. Any other questions? You guys made it easy on me. Thank you so much for paying attention. I really appreciate it. Take the introduction. Delete this and get out of your hair, sir. Thank you. Forensics white. <laughs> DOD. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if we've done a head count because this is by far the highest number that we've ever had at DCS. Forty-nine. Well, Dang, go find one more. Let's head. get to 50. Let's, let's get one more. <laughs> I want to set the record. Grab that guy that's sitting at that table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it was another month, we'd probably make it happen. <laughs> we're, we're all open to that. So, I mean, it's a long drive to go from Anderson to Greenville for our meetings. We fully understand that. I mean, Kurt's been a trooper. He's driven that for I don't know how long. Quite a while. Like yeah. years at this point. So, uh I'm very thankful, Kurt, for you setting this up. This has been really awesome. Uh, but like Chris said, I'm going to turn it back over to you to run the rest of this. I'm just going to yeah. throw that slide up here at the end for the QR code that everybody's dying for, actually. So <laughs> I don't even need to introduce it, so we'll just do that. All right, so hey, folks. Uh, at this point, we normally transition into giving uh, floor space for folks to go over any projects that they want to share about. 
And then after that, we also transition into two different villages. We open up the Red Team Village, where you normally can kind of go through exercises on how to do penetration testing. And then we open up the Blue Team Village, where normally we play a card game called Backdoors and Breaches, just a way to simulate adversary attacks and kind of role play like Dungeons and Dragons, but like your cybersecurity. And you try to find who the attackers are, uh, or how they got in, really. So at this point, we open it up to projects and have to apologize for these weird contrasts on our, our colors here. Normally we're, we're more dark, uh, so you can see the white text. But I, I'll normally open this up. I'm a pretty regular talking about projects, but then we'll kind of go to anyone in the room that wants to cover projects. Uh, but I'll be a, a model example. Uh, so I have a hobby where I work and I do software development for a MUD, which is like ancient in terms of the internet. It stands for multi-user dungeon or multi-user dimension. And it's a way to play online role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, but over text and over Telnet, so it's insecure. It's really good for a security professional to, to work in that space, but for the past pretty much two years since like COVID hit, I've been doing a refactor of that game and reprogramming a lot of the functions and functionality. So most recently, uh, I've been remaking the character uh, creation process where before we would give you like die rolls, uh, showing you samples for like strength, constitution, dexterity. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and we would show you anywhere from like three to 18, but now we're going to a point system because we recognize our players would just like game the system and get the best roles. So we're going to take that away. So that way they just have 10 points and then they can buy their attributes. So the game experience is always going to be more of their choice, not so much like random choice that they're just gaming anyway. Not with chat GPT, but I bet you could use chat GPT on the mud. Yeah. That's a cool idea. That's my project. So with that, uh, open it up, no pressure. If anyone has anything that they want to share or, or talk through. Was that for you to share this in our projects or to what? At the village. Yeah, just set up whatever we want. I got one, I guess. So, uh, so I also uh, coach the cybersecurity competition team. We do a bunch of CTFs and stuff. Um, we have one internal CTF that all of our competition team uses. Um, and then the students really enjoy using that, right, and it prepares them for the competition. Well, we also created one called 316 CTF. That's open to the public. It's, it's, game, it's, it's you know, target audience is middle schoolers and high schoolers, um, but it's open to anybody. So if you know anybody that's looking to break into the technical side of cybersecurity and doesn't want to get frustrated with all the difficult challenges out there, the hack the box, and you know, if you find anybody that's easily frustrated, uh, the 316 CTF uh, might be a good option for them. So if you have any tips, and that one, yeah. Thanks. All right, cool. Check out the website for that. It's pretty, I like it. Thank you. So the way the villages are going to break out, if you're a village, or walker, if you're a walker, so we've got fire walkers right here. I don't know where you want to set up. And then blue team village, I don't know where you're going to go, but I think we're going to do lock picking as well. So if you've never picked the lock, and you want to have that experience, it's an amazing... Um, uh, we have our iron walker now. Yeah, we have our iron walker village <laughs> set up somewhere around here, too. Red Team Village over here. Thank you all. Yeah.